From the Caribbean Sea to the Pacific Ocean, from the Amazon rainforest and the Andes mountain range, Colombia is only starting to reveal its treasures to the world. The only risk is wanting to stay. That's how the country sells itself today, putting across the message that this territory, which for many years was ravished by the drug trade, is now a reputable tourist destination. Welcome to Colombia. We're arriving in the rainy season, so everything's pretty wet. Here it's very green, everywhere. And it looks quite nice, so we're impatient for a glimmer of sun to see a little bit better. Over there, there's some clothes drying, sort of. Martin's truck arrives in the Caldas region. Every year here, as Christmas approaches, torrential rain and flooding are the daily lot of the inhabitants. Straddling the Andes, squeezed between the Coca River and the larger Magdalena River, Caldas is located in central Colombia. More than one million people live in this mountainous region, which is especially suited to coffee growing. The city of Manizales is the regional capital. So we're arriving in Manizales, which is no doubt the coffee capital of Colombia. It's coffee being renowned throughout the world. The only problem is the coffee industry produces huge amounts of waste. Coffee is the second most traded commodity in the world, just behind oil. Colombia has been growing it for almost a century and is now the world's second biggest exporter after Brazil. That said, 90% of Colombian growers are still small planters who tend to harvest by hand to select the berries at maturity. Since the middle of the 1990s, coffee prices have collapsed. In 10 years, its price halved. Small growers suffered huge losses. Not only does coffee growing no longer generate enough income for families to live on, but it produces a huge quantity of waste. For local businessman Alejandro, these two problems could have the same solution. It's a coffee seed. The green coffee berries become red like this one. This one is ready to be harvested. On this coffee branch, they pick this berry and they only keep this little part, the seed. The rest of the berry is discarded. Our idea is to use this part to grow mushrooms. This little seed only represents 2% of the biomass produced by the coffee plant. It doesn't seem like very much, but if you take all the berries on this plantation, that makes several tons, and all those tons of waste can be transformed into several tons of mushrooms. Alejandro invites Fred, Lor, Martin and Sheen to park their truck for a few days alongside the cooperative. This is where the producers in the region bring their harvests and where the coffee berries are treated before being sold. For Lor and Martin, the coffee will have to wait because it's time for class. The shade of a guava tree, a desk, some paper, a pencil. Around the world, the schoolroom is improvised according to the location. While Shin takes a siesta, Fred heads off to look round the cooperative. Nine to ten months after flowering, the coffee berries are harvested. They are then sorted, the skin removed without damaging the seed, and then washed in tanks before being left to dry. Fred continues his visit with the cafetera, the planter's house, where he has a meeting with Carmenza Jaramillo, a Colombian biologist who's been working for almost 10 years on recycling coffee waste. Thanks to her research, some 10,000 producers in the region have managed to increase their income. The project began with an idea from the Zeri Foundation, or to be more precise, from Mr. Gunter Pauli. 
along with Mario Calderon, the representative of the Manizales coffee growers, Gunter Pali thought that we had to find a solution to optimize the resources of growers in the face of falling coffee prices. Mushroom production seemed like a good idea, especially since coffee produces so much waste matter. Then Professor Chan came in to study the region's potential for mushroom production. He was chiefly inspired by the Chinese model because in China they grow rice, and with rice waste, they produce edible mushrooms. So we studied the chemical components that mushrooms like. Some like acidic soils, others alkaline. We classified all these constituents, we analyzed them, and then we converted them into chemical formulas. In the end, the Association of Coffee Growers accepted this idea. And in 1998, we started work to produce, on the one hand, edible mushrooms, but also fungi for medicinal use, all grown in coffee waste. Este material this material is called silver skin. It's a thin husk that's found around the coffee bean at the end of the process, which is removed when one wants to make decaffeinated coffee. And here we have some coffee grounds. This waste comes from a nearby producer of soluble coffee. Every day, this is thrown out by the factory into the rubbish tips of Manizales. I use it to cultivate mushrooms. Every year, a total of 12 million tons of organic material is dumped in these tips. As it rots down, this material produces millions of tons of methane and thereby contributes to global warming. Here, the two materials are already mixed together. This is done by a machine to obtain a perfect mix, which is then sterilized by a steam process. That way, we're sure no foreign organisms will pollute the mix. Nothing will grow other than the mushroom which we sow. In this bag, there's already mushroom seed which is like this and which can be found easily in Colombia. After a month in a bag like the one you just saw, we take the bags off and the mushrooms start to grow. Then all we have to do is harvest them and they're sold fresh in supermarkets. The mushroom proteins are cheap, much less expensive than meat. Since 2009 in Colombia, more than 100 companies have adopted this business model in coffee producing areas. When the harvest is done, no more mushrooms will grow in this substrate. What remains is a solid cake that we use as fertilizer and it's much more effective than the two components used separately. It remains to be seen whether, in a country of cattle rearing and barbecues, the Colombians are ready to change their eating habits. At Eliana's place, like several other restaurants in the region, mushrooms have appeared on the menu. They've not yet found their way into every kind of dish, but they are gradually finding a place. It's quite a strong flavored mushroom, but that can be handled easily enough. 
Cooking is all about having fun. For the meantime, it's not widely used in Colombia. People think mushrooms are hallucinogenic, so they have a hard time accepting them. It's not the same as in other countries. But the Colombians are gradually coming round to the idea. Especially now that people know that mushrooms contain lots of proteins and can replace meat in the diet. Here is cream of mushroom. As you can see, it's ready. Delicious. It's really good. It's not rubbery, it's tender. Another advantage is that the proteins are produced in much less time than on a farm raising cows or chickens. For example, these proteins are produced in 35 days, whereas cattle farmers take at least 18 months to produce them. The mushroom's contribution to nature is marvelous. Next time, Martin and Sheen will swap their steak and fries for mushroom and fries. In the meantime, the two of them have just one thing in mind, getting back on the road. Based on the idea that you protect what you know, alongside the roads here in Manizales are signs that show us the type of animals we are likely to encounter. What's funny is that there is even the scientific name so you know exactly what it is. Apart from Brazil, no country in the world has so many different species as Colombia. The truck carries on its way through the foothills of the Andes, which is a region for coffee, but also for guadua, a local variety of bamboo, which has been grown here for several centuries near the rivers and waterways. Here, bamboo grows like a weed which has earned it a bad reputation as exactly that, a weed. Until now, it has mainly been used by people without much money to construct dwellings, which are a bit rickety because they don't have much building skill either. But now there is a new generation of architects who firmly believe in bamboo as a material for building totally modern houses. Houses, bridges, schools, toll booths, a cathedral, even a bus terminal as big as three football pitches. Colombian architects are at the cutting edge of new uses for bamboo. This building, for example, was designed by the Colombian architect Simon Velez for the World Fair in Hanover in 2000. In making this polygon 40 meters across, he wanted to demonstrate the extraordinary artistic and architectural potential of bamboo. In Colombia, as elsewhere, bamboo has always been considered a building material for the poor. But for a few innovative architects, it's only a matter of time before bamboo definitively replaces more noble woods, concrete, and maybe even steel. Carolina Salazar is an architect. She wants to show Fred La Minoca, an eco-villa that she made entirely from bamboo. Her aim is to convince a new generation of well-heeled Colombians that bamboo is a noble material which possesses so many qualities that it's a shame not to use it. What's important when you use a natural material like wood, in this case, guadua bamboo, is to protect it well from the sun and water. If you don't do that, it will deteriorate very rapidly. Another key idea here was to create an interior microclimate to protect against the region's extreme heat. So we have a double roof to make a thermal buffer which prevents the heat from coming inside. 
al interior de la casa. Algo que también es muy importante, un factor muy Another advantage of bamboo construction is that it's an earthquake resistant material. It's very useful in a region of seismic activity to have a flexible material which can move a long way without breaking. All the water used in this house comes from rainwater. There's no connection to a network. There are several rain collection tanks around the house, which makes it totally autonomous. For hot water, there are solar panels, which work very well. Bamboo is a very versatile material. We can build a house with a very sophisticated design, very large, and which would cost a lot of money. But we can also build a modest house for a family, a social dwelling which doesn't require a lot of money. While some dogs in Colombia are lucky enough to have a kennel made of bamboo, a million people are still in need of decent housing. Bamboo grows here 20 times faster than any other tree and could well solve two problems, the lack of housing and deforestation. At the current rate of clearing, the equatorial forest will have disappeared in Colombia 20 or 30 years from now. But despite all its qualities, Bamboo is not about to replace the children's favorite tree. Come and decorate the Christmas tree. Hang some bubbles. In a few days, Martin and Sheen will spend their first Christmas in the truck. Their first Christmas on the other side of the world. There aren't any here. Hold on. I'll put that one first. So where is Father Christmas going to put the presents? He'll put them here on the couch. He's going to put all the presents here? And how's Father Christmas going to get in? He'll come through the window. He'll come through the window? We'd better leave the window open a crack then. He'll come through the window. While Christmas approaches, Fred and Laura go to meet Marcelo Villegas, an amazing creator with a fondness for bamboo. Marcelo Villegas and the architect Simon Velez have been working for years on pushing back the boundaries of what can be built using bamboo. For Marcelo, it's first and foremost an outstanding creative tool. From the tips to the roots, he uses the whole plant to make furniture which he exhibits as far afield as New York. He too dreams of changing bamboo's image. Bamboo is great, perfect. Structurally, it has the most useful form which exists in nature, the cylinder. This is a trial to give it a curve. These are the first ones we're doing. It was in the rear part, and now it's at... Ah, it's 18 centimeters from the exit, and six days ago, when we put it in, it was 43 centimeters away. In five days, it has grown 25 centimeters. Guadua is very strong. If I just use this without adding any counterweights, 
it would carry all this away and grow straight up. You have to add this weight to make it bend. All this is made of roots. I think one should use everything in a tree, from the roots to the tips of the branches. It's a much more rational way of using things. Cutting down a tree to only get three planks and leaving the rest to rot and go to waste is not very rational. I grew up with bamboo. And I think our future is going to depend in part on bamboo. It's a material which can be used for building a house and which eases the pressure which weighs on our forests and woods. There are many things we can do which could be replaced by bamboo. Many. Look at that, four. Did you see how many there were? Four. Four trailers. Here we are in Cali to change the truck's tires. The two tires you see in front of us, those are ours. There are two others waiting for us a bit farther on. We're going to put them on the truck. When you see how many people there are to change a tire, that's when you think, we'd better not break down when we're on our own. And yet, that's bound to happen over the next five years. Our truck doesn't have any wheels. What are we going to do? Are you going to carry it? So that settles the question of Christmas presents in the truck. Fred and Laura head west towards the region of Choco. 500 kilometers of difficult routes and swollen rivers await them. Along the way, they also have to find a dry spot to celebrate Christmas as a family. depths of the Colombian night, the mushrooms, the bamboo, and the children all continue growing. In the square of a small village at the end of the world, Martin and Sheen celebrate their first Christmas far from France. Tonight they have faith. They know that Father Christmas will find a solution to get into the truck. And they know that the adults are preparing the world of tomorrow for them because that's what we do, right? Mm -hmm. 